but we are in our even more series. And in this series, we have been talking about how the presence of God shifts, say shifts. It shifts not only your expectation, which is your faith, but it also shifts your capacity for more. Say capacity Capacity. for more. So every Christmas we talk with our kiddos about the capacity for more. And we explain this to them. We explain that the capacity for more is the ability to manage, to handle, and to just know what to do with blessings, right? All the parents in the room know where I'm going with this. But every year we talk to our kiddos right before Christmas and we say, look, we know that you know that Christmas time is a time when we give you great blessings, right? Right? This is obvious. We know that you have a big, long list of all the things that you want from us. But here's the thing, kiddos. In order to make that happen, we're going to need to see that you know how to manage what we gave you last year. We're going to need to know that you, you know, at least took a couple weeks before you broke the blessings last time. Amen? And even more so than that, we're really going to need to know that you know how to share what God has given you and maybe unload some of that blessing that is in your life over to others. Because here's a little, here's a little truth. I'll be, I'll be really vulnerable. Is this okay? Yeah. Is it all right if I'm really honest with you guys? Okay. So I may have shared this at some point, but I, I really sincerely, when people talk about having a sweet tooth, like I, I have a real problem. Okay. I have a, I have a real issue. All you guys know is that Pastor Daniel talks all the time about how I'm the most disciplined person that there is, right? He talks always so highly of me. The reason that he talks like that is because I choose not to eat sweets like at all because I've got a real problem. Okay. So I choose to not bake for our family, even though I love sweets because I know that I'm going to be the last one that's finishing it all off. So if I do bake a pan of brownies, okay, I'm going to need to know who's with me on this one. If I bake a pan of brownies, which is one of my favorites, I'm going to cut a small little portion for everybody in the family, okay? Like a tiny, tiny little piece, including myself, and I'm going to say, this is all you guys need, okay? Everybody's just getting this one little piece, okay? And then everybody's like, no, mom, give us more. And I'm like, nope, it's all we need. We only need the one little piece. And then after everybody goes off to sleep, (laughs) y'all, I fight it. I fight it the whole time. The whole time, I wait till I just can't wait any longer, and then I go into the kitchen and I give in to my worst ability to eat the entire pan so that I don't have to deal with it tomorrow. Because tomorrow I'm going to have the same situation, and the problem is there's just never been a moment when I have had brownies or ice cream or anything sweet, okay? There's never been a moment where I've been like, yeah, I think that's enough. I think I've had enough. I've never come to that spot. Now, I may get full on food, but as soon as you put the dessert in front of me, I'm like, no, I'm not full. I need need a lot more of that, okay? I've never found that that's enough spot. And y'all, the same thing is true with the blessings of God. There is never a spot. We were never designed to come to a point in our lives where God, that's enough. I've had enough of the presence of God. I've had enough of the word of God. I've had enough of the revelation of God. I'm full. I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied with the miraculous ways that God has moved in my life. I have had enough of what God wants to bless me with in this life. I've had enough of God's leadership. I've had enough. I'm satisfied right here where I am. We were not designed to ever say that's enough when it comes to things of God. The scripture that we've been standing on in this series is Romans 15, 13, and it says, may the God of hope fill you. What's it say? Fill you with a little bit, maybe some of it. How much of it? All joy and peace. Not just a little splash, family. Not just a little dabble, do you? He says to fill us with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, y'all forgive me, it's probably just the fast, but every single analogy that I have is food-based in this message (laughs) and sweets-based as well. So when I think about overflow, y'all, I think about one of those delightful cream-filled, jelly-filled, strawberry-filled donuts 
Anybody know which ones I'm talking about? Don't worry, I'm not eating those right now. However, I know, forgive me if I'm causing you to stumble, but you can think about it because you'll know what I'm talking about, okay? When I think about one of those jelly-filled donuts, if I'm going to take the time to eat a jelly-filled donut, a cream-filled donut, when I go to take a bite of that donut, I, I need that donut to just, just get everywhere, right? I need to know that that donut has been filled to overflowing, right? Because if I'm gonna go to the effort to eat that donut, the last thing I need is to find a, a, a dry donut. That's ridiculous, right? The last thing I want is for somebody that's filling that donut to be filling that donut with a light hand. I need you to fill that with a heavy hand, right? Nobody wants to open up. I opened up a donut one time that I was, that I was disappointed in as I was eating it because I don't do it that often. And as I was opening up that donut, I was like, you know what? I don't know who did this. Is this a joke? Is somebody playing a prank on me? This is what God is talking about. He says that it is supposed to overflow. We are supposed to be overflowing with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Y'all, our God is not a God of just enough. Our God is the God of the overflow. He is the God of abundance, abundance of joy, abundance of peace, abundance of hope. That's his heart for us. As his kids, if you're a parent, you know that your heart for your kids is that they have blessings that just never stop. They have blessing upon blessing. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more. Immeasurably. That means there's no way to measure how much God is able to do. We can't calibrate it. We can't quantify it. We can't put a number or a label on it because he is able to do immeasurably more. That means far more abundantly than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Family, that means that we have to start praying God-sized prayers. We have to stop praying us-sized prayers. We have to stop praying the type of prayers that we go, I think God could work out this miracle. I think if, I think if God really wanted to, I think he could maybe move in this area. No, we have to put prayers into the hands of God that are asking God, you do the miraculous, immense miserable thing that was greater than my imagination and allow God to be God. But sometimes, sometimes I think where we get tripped up is the season that we find ourselves in. Sometimes we don't find ourselves in that season that feels so abundant. Sometimes we don't find ourselves in that season that feels so hope-filled, so joy-filled. Sometimes we find ourselves in a season that feels like barely enough. A season that is marked with rejection and invisibility and pain. It's a dry donuts kind of season. And those seasons, they can change the size of our prayers. And we can begin to feel like this season is just a hurdle that I've got to get over. Instead of a season to step into God's abundance. Every season in your life is a season to step into God's abundance. Say, my season is significant. I want y'all to write that down in your notes and I want you to say it out loud like you mean it. My season is significant. Look at your neighbor, say your season is significant. Whatever that season is, whatever that season is, right where you are, your season is significant and there is power that you have access to. And I want to show you in the word. So many um, stories in the Bible are about these incredible men and women of God. And we can look at them and some we can look at them. We're like, oh yes, I am supposed to be, I'm supposed to be like that. I'm supposed to be a woman of faith. I'm supposed to be a man of faith. I'm supposed to be like Daniel in the lion's den. Like some of them we can look at and say that I'm going to, Lord, help me be more like that. Some of the men and women in the Bible, we can look at and we can go, I know why you put them in the Bible, Lord, because I was supposed to recognize what not to do, right? Anybody have any people in your life like that? You may find, I don't know, I, I probably shouldn't ask you to raise your hand on that one. Sometimes we have people, humans alive in our lives that are really great demonstrators for us of exactly what not to do in life. We can be grateful for those too, right? Those living lessons, right? But then there's another type of person in the Bible, 
And their stories are ones that teach us about purpose and about significance. Today we're gonna talk about somebody whose one choice changed biblical history. However, others maybe overlooked this person. We're gonna be talking about the boy with the five loaves and the two fish. And a lot of you are like, oh, I know this story. You, you don't have to know a lot to know the story. It's a miracle story, it's amazing. But there is something in this story that I think is really, really important. So I want you to go with me to Mark chapter six, verse 30. It says, the apostles gathered around Jesus and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat. Pause right there. So the disciples had come to Jesus and they were like, Lord, we have been, we've been ministering over here. We've been ministering over there. People were getting healed over here. Like people are understanding about the Messiah over here. But we've been so busy, we haven't even had a chance to eat. We're worn out. And this is what Jesus says. So he says to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So when we look at this, we can see that God is a God of compassion, right? But when I look at this, I also see and realize very, very clearly that neither Jesus nor the disciples were parents because they really believed that there was a quiet place and no such thing exists. However, he was the Messiah, so he was going to find one. But we see that they were worn out. They were needing rest. So look back again in verse 32. It says, so they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. So this crowd of people who knows who Jesus, knows who the disciples were, because honestly, at this time, they, they're kind of like getting some notoriety. They're a, little, they're a little famous. Like people are like, what? Jesus, the disciples. They hear that they're going there. So they run faster than Jesus and the disciples can get there in a boat. And they're waiting for them on the other side when Jesus and the disciples pull up. One, those are some determined folks. But just me, this is not in the word. This is what I imagine when I'm reading this. I know that these disciples have just been told by Jesus, hey, let me take you on a vacation, okay? We're gonna go on a little vacation. So these disciples are getting in that boat going across the river and they're like, this is gonna be good. And then they see all these people that are wanting something else from them on the other side. I can only imagine that the disciples are like, no, no, Jesus, no, get back in the boat. Let's go back. We can find another quiet place. I know that this doesn't have to be it. We don't have to do this. I can imagine they didn't wanna stop. But Jesus saw something different. It says when Jesus landed and he saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So what was different here about these people was Jesus saw in their faces that they were there looking for a leader. Jesus stopped because he could see that they wanted to follow. Y'all, it makes all the difference in the world to teach somebody who wants to learn. Makes all the difference. All the school teachers, administrators in the room, you know what I mean by that. It makes all the difference. I think a lot of the time, a majority of the issues that we face as people, as people of God, come from us fighting God to lead. But in this moment, Jesus, even though he had something else to do, he stopped because he saw something different in them. In this crowd, he saw people that just really, really wanted to follow. So let's pick up here in Matthew, in verse 14, chapter 14, verse 14. I actually won't ask you to go there, but I just want you to see this. Jesus took the time to teach them, so he taught them many, many things. And Matthew says, and he healed their sick. So we know that he spent hours there teaching. He spent hours healing. And then we pick up in Mark 6, verse 35. It says, by this time, it was late in the day. Okay, so late in the day in the Bible means that this was when the sun was going down. So people at this time weren't out hanging out after dark. They were in their homes when the sun went down. They had either already eaten their food or they were preparing to eat their food and go right to bed. So that these people were out this late was a big deal. They were hungry. And it was really honestly too late for them to be eating. So his disciples come to him and they say, this is a remote place 
and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus answered them and he says, nah, you give them something to eat, right? This is, this is Jesus' response to them. But what they say next is so important because they said to him, what? Jesus, that would take more than half a year's wages, exclamation point. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? So what we haven't read yet is this is a crowd of 5,000 men, not counting the women and children that were gathered there as well. The disciples are looking around and they're like, okay, Lord, like if, if we need to feed all of these people, even just a morsel, it's gonna be at least eight months worth of our pay. God, that is crazy, what would we do? In this moment, I realize as many miracles as they have experienced, as many things as they have seen God done in the most miraculous of ways, the wildest of things, spit and mud in people's eyes, people, blind people seeing, as many things as they have experienced from God, the moment they were met with a simple instruction that felt a little difficult to accomplish, their first response was doubt. Their first response was exclamation points of annoyance of, Jesus, are you serious? You want me to do what? And I would ask myself, is that the story of the disciples or is that the story of the present day church? Because how many times have we prayed prayers that are miraculous to the Lord and watch God deliver, watch God show up, watch God heal, watch God intervene, watch God provide, yet the next time he asks us to do something that feels a little challenging, we go, what? God, you want me to do what? What are we gonna do? Because that is the place in which our minds and our hearts often go. But Jesus, in his kindness, answers us with a, a solution, just like he did the disciples. In verse 38, he says, all right, I'll problem solve for you. How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five loaves and two fish. And the book of John says, John said that it was a boy that brought barley loaves, five barley loaves. And then if we look again in verse 39, then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups. Y'all, didn't we just say this is group Sunday, right? Yeah. Jesus directed people to gather together in groups. What? This isn't just our idea. Jesus said it. It's okay. Y'all are quiet. I'm going to come back to that one. He said, gathered together in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks. Y'all, even Jesus prayed over the food and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were what? satisfied. They all ate and they were satisfied. They all ate and they didn't just get a morsel. They all ate and they were satisfied. And then look at this. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the women who had eaten was 5,000 plus women and children. Family, this is what we have to see. Not only when that bread was placed in the hands of Jesus, not only was there more than enough, but there were 12 basketfuls baskets of leftovers given to the 12 disciples. One basket of leftovers of the extras to be sent home with each disciple because Jesus wanted the disciples to know, I am a personal Messiah. I am a personal deliverer. I am a personal provider. I will provide individually because I care about your life. And he wants us to see that very same thing today. We can trust him. We can trust him with the stuff that seems impossible. We can trust him with the stuff that seems minor. We can trust him. This is one of the most famous miracle moments in the whole Bible. It's taught all over the globe by teachers, preachers, pastors, evangelists, missionaries. Everybody teaches this story because it demonstrates God's provision and his power and what is truly possible in the hands of Jesus but what I want to focus on today, what I want us to see is that it took a little boy stepping up for a miracle to happen. It was just a kid, just a kid. 
Biblical theologians believe he was someplace between childhood and about 20 years of age. He wasn't technically considered anybody really important. He wasn't like of a royal bloodline particularly. Um, we don't even believe his parents were actually there. But the, the testimony of John about that being a barley loaf is important because barley bread was actually considered to be the bread of families that are in poverty. So we can look, this boy is a kid. He's impoverished. And yet he was willing He was willing to step up. So here is my following question then. Where were the other 5,000 men on this hillside? Where were the other 5,000 men when they were asked, hey, do you have anything to share with the group? I imagine there were a lot of men there that had at least a snack. I imagine there were a lot of men there that were probably just looking down at their feet when they were being asked by the disciples if they had anything. I imagine that. And let's say that the men didn't plan that day for any food. That's okay. We all know that not all men are great planners, right? That's okay. It's okay. That's okay. We know our skill sets. Amen? It's okay. This is important. There's a reason why the Lord brings two people together. Now, I'm going to pick on the ladies for a minute because there were women and children there. And don't you tell me there was not a mama there that was full of snacks for her kiddos. However, every single one of these people looked away and said, I don't have anything. And I believe the situation happened because all of these people looked around and saw a sea of people. And I've got like a, a bite of bread for my kid. Or I brought, I brought a little, little bit of bread for myself. This, this, why would you want this? No, I don't have anything. I don't have anything. But my educated guess is that everyone else thought that what they brought was insignificant. They didn't speak up. and They didn't step up. Because what they thought they brought was insignificant. Your revelation moment for today, family, is your season is significant. No matter the season, it is significant. Every single season that you walk through in life is significant. It doesn't matter if you are young. It doesn't matter if you are wonderfully old. It doesn't matter if it's a good season, if it's an awful season. It doesn't matter if you feel healthy, if you feel just a little bit broken. It does not matter what your season is because the intention of God is not that we skip over our seasons. The intention of God is that no matter the season you find yourself in, whether God placed you in that season, or whether you placed you in that season, you have an opportunity to form faith, to begin to trust God, to do the impossible, to use what feels less than valuable sometimes in your own eyes. Because just like that little boy, I bet you're facing challenges. We hear about them every single week in the lobby with you, and we love to get to stand in faith with you. I bet you're facing challenges just like the little boy. I bet there are times that you feel overlooked, disregarded, poorly resourced. I bet there are times just like that little boy that you feel a little bit insignificant. But family, just like that little boy, your life can be right in the middle of the miraculous over and over and over again but not because of what you have or because of who you are, but because you choose to step up and keep surrendering your basket before the Lord, just like the little boy, just like this basket here represents your life. You are to keep coming to Jesus and saying, God, this is, these are my strengths. These are my weaknesses. This is what I'm not that great at, Father. These are the gifts that you've given me. Lord Jesus, is there anything that you can use in this basket of my life, Father? Is there any purpose in here that you would like? I give you whatever you want, Lord. Whatever you would like in this. If you would find anything in this basket of my life that you would say, remove that. Jackie, that doesn't need to be in your life. Is there anything I should be removing? Is there anything that doesn't belong in my life in this season any longer that I've left there? The basket, just like the little boy, we are to be stepping up and surrendering that to the Lord and saying, Could you use anything here? Is there anything you want to do? You can have it. You can have it all, Lord. Whatever it is, you can have it. It is our job to step up and surrender that, though. Because 
the overflow, the even more, the abundance, the joy, the peace, the hope that God has for you is on the other side of your surrender, your continual surrender, not just the surrender of salvation, which is so important, but your continual surrender that leads to life transformation over and over and over again. Because God doesn't just want us to stop at salvation. He wants us to move on to being real disciples of Christ. He wants us to move on to real authority and power because of the Jesus Christ that lives in us. But most of the time, the hardest part is stepping up. No matter the season, as adults, we have the most difficult time with it. That's why Jesus used a little boy. We have the most difficult time with it because we are dizzying ourselves with all of the things that we have going on and to be responsible for. I don't remember the name of the game, but you know that that game where you put your head on the bat and then you just run around in circles lots and lots of times and then you're supposed to stand up and walk in a straight line? I feel like that's what we're like as adults the majority of the time. And when you are continually in that state, it's so difficult to say, I will step up with clarity and obedience to whatever it is that you have for me, God. But that is the hard spot that we find ourselves in. And today we're going to learn four things from this boy about how to step up and trust God no matter what your basket looks like. Say, no matter what my basket looks like. Number one, God's blessing comes when I follow his lead. God's blessing comes when I follow his lead. Some of you are like, yeah, I mean, that's obvious, right? <laughs> this, is, this is an obvious statement. You can think it. It's true. This is a simple, simple statement that we should all really get and grasp and understand. But my question for you then is, why are we still fighting with God to be in charge? If we get The blessing comes when I follow after you, God. Why do we still fight to be in charge? Family, it's because there is a great difference between knowing something and choosing to do that something. Psalm 16 verse 11 says, you will show me the path of life. And we read it sometimes like, you will show me the path of life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you will show me the path of life. But very little of the time do we realize that we get so stuck telling God what is best for us instead of saying, God, you, you are going to show me the path of life. Family, Jesus stopped to care for those 5,000 people that had gathered, even though he had a plan to do something else, even though he was on mission to do something else. How often do we miss the mission that's in our way just because we got our eyes locked on what we're doing next. That's not even in my notes. I was talking to myself on that one. Jesus stopped because he saw that the people were desperate to be led. He saw that they wanted to be led. They wanted a shepherd. My question is, are you desperate for God to have his way or are you desperate for God to give you yours? Sometimes I think the prayers that we pray as believers are prayers of God just, Lord, I just really, this is really going to be really good for my life. I just really feel like this would be the, the best thing if you would just give me this one thing instead of prayers that say, God, have your way. Father, let your will be done in my life as it is in heaven, not according to my will, but according to your will and strengthen me for that mission as you call me to it. This kid's opportunity to be involved in Jesus's miracle was literally right in front of him. And he had no clue. It's great to look at the story and be like, that was, that was a good kid. But he didn't know that he was literally surrendering to such a massive miracle. He could have been so distracted by his own hunger in that moment. I would imagine that this kid who is out past when he's supposed to be out who did think ahead, whether it was his mama that did it for him or what, but he brought his own food. I could imagine in that moment when they're like, does anybody have any food that you'd be willing to share? I don't know about you, but I would probably have scarfed mine down very quickly. (laughs) Anybody else? Anybody else with me, right? I'm out here all alone. Y'all are leaving me vulnerable, right? Thank you, P.O. 
Because the truth is I don't like to share. That's something that the Lord works with me on and I don't share my food. But this boy could have been so, so distracted in this moment by what he thought was going on. It's, it's dinner time, I need to eat. But how much of the time are we distracted by other things in the path where God is trying to take us to that we don't even see what God is asking us to do instead? Family, what are you distracted by in this season? What is wearing on you that is not your weight to carry? What is the heaviness that you are holding on to that God is saying, no, 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 let that go. Let that go. Because whatever steals your attention is not worth it. It's not worth it. Number two, God's blessing. God's blessing isn't limited by my limitations. God's blessing is not limited by my limitations. Family, God can use and strengthen anything that has been surrendered to him. That's the important part, surrendered to him. He can use and strengthen anything within us. He can make a testimony out of the worst moment of your life if you choose to surrender it before him and say, God, here, here's the basket of my life. This is the situation that I'm in. This is my great need. And I'm going to ask you to do something that matters out of this thing that just feels like a mess. Anything surrendered to God can be used and strengthened. I love 2 Corinthians 12 verses 9 and 10. So often we read verse 9, and I think we skip verse 10 a lot of the time because 9 is so good, but I want to read them both. It says, but he said to me, my grace, say my grace. All right, we'll try it again. Say my grace is sufficient for you. For my power, sufficient means more than enough. For my power is made perfect in weakness. This is where y'all should be so ready to shout. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Meaning it's not about me really. It's about what God can do through me. But verse 10 is the part that I think we skip so often. It says, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am strong. Now, that doesn't mean he is not openly inviting a life of sin. No, he is saying we are strong when we recognize I've come to the end of myself and my own capability. I've come to the edge of what I am able to do. I've come to the end of the hope that I find within me. And now, now, God, now is your time to shine, God. Now's the time when you show up and you bring the power, you bring the big guns, you do the things that I was never able to do on my own. Joel 3.10 says, let the weak say, I am strong. Family, if limitations were concerns for Jesus, he would not have chosen a kid to play the hero in this miracle moment. He just wouldn't have. He placed a child right in the front of our view so that we could see the picture of weakness in a lot of ways, vulnerability in a lot of ways. He wanted us to see it is about the willingness of the heart. God will do the rest. It's about the obedience in your choice. God will do the rest. And please, please, never, ever, ever think that people will see your potential like God does. People will never see the potential inside of you like God does. People will see the limitations. People will see the weaknesses. And they may not be so great at celebrating the strengths. Because the truth is, if you look for the approval and the affirmation of others, you will only have a limited view of your life like you're wearing like snorkeling goggles. You know what I mean? The kind where you just can't see out the sides. There's only this view. Whether those people are good for you or not good for you, they can't see the purpose that God placed on the inside of you. So they don't get to determine what's on the inside of you. They don't get to determine what can come out of you when placed in the hands of God. But if you look for God's approval, if you look for God's approval, then your weaknesses become opportunities for his power for his power. If Jesus would use this kid's willingness in this story that we all know, if Jesus would use this kid's willingness, because we all know that God doesn't need perfection out of us. He doesn't need that. 
Matter of fact, he said, we're not gonna accomplish perfection on this side. Doesn't mean we shouldn't continue striving towards being more like Christ. We also know that he needs willing and he needs obedient. But if Jesus would use this kid's willingness, then you have no justification for discrediting yourself for a move of God in your life. No justification, no justification. Number three, God's blessing is stewarded through accountability. God's blessing is stewarded through accountability. Now, what do I mean by that? Because those are some big words. Ecclesiastes 4.9 says, two people. How many? Two people are better than one, for they can help each other succeed. Remember back in Mark chapter 6, verse 39, it says, then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in what? groups on the green grass. Family, there is a reason that we are doing groups Sunday. There is a reason in this big, wonderful church that we encourage you to join a group, that we encourage you to find a community because two are stronger together than one. The good things in life are best shared, right? Guess what else? The challenges are two. Because Ecclesiastes 4.10 goes on to say, if one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But somebody who falls alone is in real trouble. Groups will surround you and they will make you better together, yes. But together you will see more miracles. Together your faith will grow. Together you will be able to stand up and recognize what God is calling you to when you have your circle around you. Join a group, okay? Say, I'm gonna join a group. I knew that not everybody was gonna say it out loud because you're a group of honest people, but I want y'all to join a group. They are so, so powerful. You gotta find your people. Number four, God's blessing is multiplied only. Say only when you put it in Jesus' hands. God's blessing is multiplied then. It is only significant, it is only miraculous, it is only powerful in the hands of Jesus when we take it from our basket and we lift it to Him. God will multiply what you thought was significant, insignificant, if you surrender it. What you thought in your life was insignificant, God will multiply the blessing on that, God will multiply the strength on that if you surrender it to Him. Family, he will do the miraculous in that area that is heavy for you. He will do the miraculous, but you have to release it. He will overwhelm you with favor, but you have to let him lead. And if you are in need in your finances, family, you're gonna have to give him your finances fully. That's why we encourage you to tithe in this church because when we tithe, when we say, God, this is what I'm giving back to you, do with it what you will and bless the rest because of my obedience. This is what we do according to the word. If you're in need in your family, you're gonna have to follow Jesus more closely yourself so that they can see him in your life, not just hear you talking about him. This season is significant. Say, my season is significant. God has abundance. He has overflow. He has joy. He has hope. He has peace. He has the even more for you, but it is found in your surrendering it. I'm going to read Romans 15, 13 again, because I want you to hear it this time. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Would you stand to your feet with me? I've invited the worship team to come back and they're gonna lead us in a simple, a simple chorus. And what I ask is that you would close your eyes and you would let this be your prayer right now. Thank you, Jesus. Today. 
do whatever you want to to do whatever you want to and i will make room for you to do whatever you want to to do whatever you want to God, we ask you that in this place, as we make room, as we step up, as we surrender, Father, we ask you that you would have your way in our lives. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in this place and you're finding yourself struggling, if you have realized this morning that, yeah, I'm struggling with my season, maybe you're in this place and you are struggling with your significance, You're struggling to feel like, yeah, my life in its current state could not really be that powerful in the hands of God. That is a lie. God wants you to surrender right where you are. Maybe you're in this place and you are struggling with just the idea of following after God. You're fighting Him. You're fighting Him to be obedient with what He's asking of you. Maybe you're in this place and you're just really distracted. Father, I pray right now Whatever the struggle is in the season that we are in, God, I pray that you would help us all to see that our season is significant. You can make a shift, you can make a change at the snap of a finger with whatever we surrender before you, God, with whatever we take our hands off of and say, God, this is better under your care. This is better under your power. This is better when you multiply strength upon this situation. My family is better when surrendered to you. My lost loved ones are better when surrendered to you. God, I thank you in this place that we would learn to truly surrender to you and help us to see that you will multiply and you will strengthen whatever we trust you with. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe you're in this place and you would say, I have never asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of my life. I've never surrendered my life to his lordship. I've never asked him to forgive me of my sins. I have never repented. I have never tried to follow after Christ. I've never acknowledged that Jesus went to the cross and died on that cross and rose again three days later so that I didn't have to walk through so many individual struggles on my own, but that I could walk in freedom, that I could walk with purpose, that I could walk in healing, that I could walk in hope. I didn't realize that, and today I do. Today I realize that I need to ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord of my life. That's the first person. Maybe the second person is someone in this room or watching that would say, I have lived my life for Jesus before, but I made a hard turn and I ran the other direction because people disappointed me. People let me down. Life didn't look like what I thought it would look like. I found following after him to be difficult and I stopped. At the count of three, I'm gonna give both of you an opportunity to lift your hand, pray a simple prayer of salvation and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord today. So if one You are the first person that needs to ask Jesus for salvation. Two, maybe you are the second person that needs to rededicate. Three, I would love for the both of you to lift your hands up all across the room, all across the room. If you would like to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I see you over there. I see you over there. I see you back there. I see you over here. I see you over there. I see you over there. I see you over there. I see you back there. I see you there. I see you over here. I see you back there. I see y'all. Church family, can we all just bow our heads and can we all pray this prayer of salvation? Whether you lifted your hand, whether you didn't lift your hand, God sees your heart. Can we say this together? Say, dear Jesus, today is my day. Today is the day that I start fresh. I receive you, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and my Savior. I acknowledge that you died on the cross so that I could be free. I ask you today to forgive me for the sin in my life, the choices I've made, and I repent of living my life for me. Today, I surrender my life to you. You are my Lord and you are my Savior. In the mighty name of Jesus, we all pray. And everybody said, 
Amen. Amen, family. 